Chapter 12. Shmuel thinks of an answer to Bruno's question. It's probably a good idea just to sort of um, to go back and, and, and have a look at what that question actually was. Can anyone remember what the question that Bruno asked? No. All right. We'll see if it becomes revealed more clearly as we go through the chapter here. Anyway, it starts with this. And starting with dialogue is a little bit um, unusual, but it does progress the story quite well. All I know is this, began Shmuel. Before we came here, I lived with my mother and father and my brother Joseph in a small flat above the store where Papa makes his watches. Every morning, we ate our breakfast together at 7 o'clock. And while we went to school, Papa mended watches that people brought made him new ones, sorry, and made new ones too. I had a beautiful watch that he gave me but I don't have it anymore. It had a golden face, and I wound it up every night before I went to sleep, and it always told the right time. So good craftsmanship, good quality of these sorts of things. And what a simple life. He enjoyed his family. He enjoyed breakfast at 7 o'clock. These simple little details. And they're the sorts of things that some of you put in your Holocaust diaries, those simple little details that made it a really believable sort of story. We see these characters being hugely realistic, Okay, we don't look at them and go, oh, that's never going to happen sort of thing. And there's this reference to this watch that um, Schmuel had at one stage. Now, this would have been stolen by the Nazis. And he mentions that later on um, when he says, they took it from me. Who? The soldiers, of course. Um, as if it was the most obvious thing in the world. The Nazis did all of that sort of thing. They took all their personal possessions, anything that could be used that was sort of valuable, and you probably notice too that from some of the um, documentaries we've seen, a few of those items were actually stored away and not necessarily just pilfered and, and, and stolen in, in the way we would expect, but were actually filed away in different sorts of places. So some of them were recovered um, at a later stage. So they continue through, and we get these really simple discussions going through. And I like how in the text here we've got these very simple diagrams that show how different these characters actually are. The Star of David on the armband that Schmiel has to wear and the Nazi insignia that, um, that Bruno is so familiar with. Because, let's face it, that's on the armband that his father would wear, but not, not Bruno himself. He's not yet a Nazi. Okay? He hasn't yet been indoctrinated into that world completely, um, even though he's well and truly on the way. And they talk about these for a little while, and they sort of realize how similar they are, but a little bit different. Okay, so, and that's really how you would describe these two kids. They are very similar in age and birth date and all that sort of stuff, but different in their outlook on the world, different in their um, experiences, even though they, you know, they end up dying at the same time together, towards the end of the text. And this little comment here... Um, <laughs> It's, it does sort of show how childish they are. All the same, said Bruno. I think I'd quite like one. I don't know which one I'd prefer, though. Your one or father's. As if he gets to make a decision. Like, as if he gets to choose. You know, he, he, he doesn't get the significance of what these actually mean. Okay? So we have some really good examples of what we would, I suppose, call iconography. These are icons used within the text. Really strong symbols of segregation, of power of isolation, of persecution, all those sorts of things that we've discussed at length before. Um, and they talk about their sort of history, how they came to be where they are. Um, and Schmuel reveals that, you know, they had to wear the armbands for a few months, he said, and then things changed. I came home one day and Mama said we couldn't live in our house anymore. That happened to me too, shouted Bruno. So there are strong similarities between their lives. Even though Schmuel was removed by, from his home by Nazi officers, so was Bruno, but one was a sort of more peaceful move than the others. Okay. Um, no, but when we were told we couldn't live in our house, we had to move to a different part of um, Caracal, where the soldiers built a big wall, and my mother and father and I had to live in one room. And this freaks Bruno out. All of you living in the one room together. 
And then the bombshell hits and Shmuel um, reveals that there were actually other people living in that room as well. And Bruno's like, oh, that, that, that's not possible. Here I live in a three-story house and I think it's too small. And you're telling me more than one family lives in one room together. That doesn't make any sense. Because he's never seen that sort of stuff. Okay? And he mentions it here. You know, that doesn't make any sense. He, he finds it too unbelievable to, to consider to be true. And then we talk about the train. And these trains, again, are a really strong symbol of the Holocaust. And you've picked up on that before, I'm sure. Um, the train was horrible, said Shmuel. There were too many of us in the carriages, for one thing. There was no air to breathe, and it smelled awful. Because these people are on these trains for days on end. So there's excrement everywhere. There are dead bodies that are just nowhere else to sort of put. So it would have been an absolutely horrendous experience for someone of Shmuel's age to, um, to experience. And we compare that to Bruno's experience, where he went in, you know, absolute luxury on the train that he was um, taken to Auschwitz in. <laughs> and Bruno's silliness just pops up again here, um, where he says, you know, you should have used one of the doors to just go out and find a carriage that had a, a little bit more space. And Shmuel says, there weren't any doors, said Shmuel. Of course there were doors, said Bruno with a sigh. They're at the end, he repeated. Just pass through the buffet section, which is where you go to get served your food and that sort of stuff. And it's, it, the, the lack of understanding is just severe here. It's quite interesting. There weren't any doors, insisted Schmuel. If there had been, we would all have got off. So he's much more realistic in his understanding of the world. Bruno mumbled something under his breath along the lines of, of course there were, but he didn't say it loud enough so that Schmuel didn't hear him. So he's trying to protect the friendship a little bit there, I suppose. And then, of course, Shmuel reveals that he was separated from his family and his mama was taken away. And he looked very sad when he told this story and Bruno didn't know why. It didn't seem like such a terrible thing to him. And after all, much the same thing had happened to him. That's why he doesn't get it, because he sees that he is a victim in this as well. Okay, he's the underdog um, at the same time. And then they try and find some things in common. What sort of things do you like? You know, do you like playing football, exploration, all that sort of stuff? Um, Shmuel looked, um, shook his head and didn't answer. He looked back towards the huts and turned back to Bruno. He didn't want to ask the next question, but the pains in his stomach made him. You don't have any food on you, do you? He asked. I'm afraid not, said Bruno. I mean to bring some chocolate, but I forgot. So even though he was, he's so hungry that he's feeling that you know, his stomach is in agonising pain, he still didn't want to do this, which sort of shows a certain level of pride in Shmuel. It shows that he doesn't like asking for help because he knows that, and probably throughout his interactions with his family, that's the way they've lived their lives. They can support themselves, they can look after each other, they don't need assistance. Which you would pretty much have to do in these sorts of circumstances. But it sort of overwhelms him. And the mention of chocolate, which is, you know, this sort of exotic food that you only have on special occasions, and this is the sort of thing that Bruno has every day. Okay, so again, another really good distinction between the two characters. <laughs> and Bruno stupidly says, perhaps you can come to dinner with us one evening, said Bruno, although he wasn't sure if it was a very good idea. Perhaps, said Schmuel, although he didn't sound convinced. Or I could come to you, said Bruno. Perhaps I could come and meet your friends, he added hopefully. Now, he's not doing this necessarily to, um, to share food and to in continue the relationship. He, Bruno just wants to meet other kids. He wants to use Schmuel as an avenue to go and meet some other boys and girls that he can uh, possibly go and play with. So his justification for doing this is a little bit um, strange, a little bit odd. And then, of course, they realise that they can crawl under the fence, but they decide not to do so at this stage. All right. Let's skip through. Towards the very end... Um, this chapter here becomes quite important. After all, he reasoned, they might not want me to be, oops, be friends. 
with him anymore. And if that happens, they might stop me coming out here at all. By the time he went through his front door and smelled the beef that was roasting in the oven for dinner, he had decided that it was better to keep the whole story to himself for the moment and not breathe a word about it. It would be his own secret. Well, his and Schmuel's. So he knows from his interactions with others that keeping some information secret is actually very important. 